Hello and welcome to Prism of the Past, a weekly series about historical events, people, and situations from the fascinating to the forgotten. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to discuss the Solfatara in Naples, Italy. For any of you that have watched any of my Twitch streams, you know that I've lived in Italy for a little while in my life, so this place holds a special spot in my heart. It's a place that I visited as a child and it's something that I still find incredibly fascinating. And when I'm able to go travel again and go back to Italy, I would love to revisit the Solfatara. So in case you can't tell, we're going to yet another volcanic destination. So let's jump right into it and talk about the strange history of this specific volcano in Italy. Solfatara is a volcanic crater at Pozzoli near Napoli. It's dormant, but still emits jets of stream with sulfurous flames. Solfatara itself is located within Campi Flegri, which is a caldera cluster along the Bay of Naples, which is also home to the more well-known Vesuvius. Calderas, if you've forgotten from previous episodes, are craters formed after volcanic eruptions. The most obvious manifestation of the magma under the surface of the Campi Flegri is La Solfatara, a region of intense hydrothermal activity. There have also been repeated cycles of uplift and subsidence near the city of Pozzoli, sometimes on the order of meters per decade, along with degassing within the Gulf of Pozzoli. Its name, Solfatara, actually translates to sulfur place in Italian. But before I get too deep into Solfatara's history throughout humankind, I want to talk about how Solfatara was formed and how it's changed over the years. So first, let's take a step back and try to understand Solfatara in more basic terms. Solfateras are fumaroles that emit sulfurous gases. In order to better understand the science behind Solfatara, we have to first understand those. According to the USGS or US Geological Survey, Fumaroles are openings in the Earth's surface that emit steam and volcanic gases, such as sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide. They can occur as holes, cracks, or fissures near active volcanoes or in areas where magma has risen into the Earth's crust without erupting. It can vent for centuries or quickly go extinct depending on the longevity of its heat source. However, according to my sources, these solfateras in Italy are not quite like the ones in Iceland, where we have to explore Pozzuoli's solfatara in its own separate entity and see how it's formed. One source explains. The Flagrian Fields, Campi Flegri Caldera in Italy had one well-documented eruption during the historical period 1538. Another eruption at Solfatara in 1198 is reported by 16th and 17th century scholars and has been commonly regarded as uncertain. In this paper, we discuss the circumstantial evidence and report of this eruption, then discuss the relevance of drawings made in the 13th through 15th century illustrating the Solfatara and the primary literary and historical resources describing the site. I was able to download this paper on ResearchGate and do a bit more digging. And apparently though the eruption of 1198 isn't sourced, it's said that in the year 1198, when Frederick was ruling, Solfatara ejected a great fire with large clusters of stones, which damaged all the village. It is possible that this eruption wasn't as noteworthy as some claim. However, since the memory of it seemed to fade away within a few years, it seems most likely that the events of 1198 were a minor event and as the paper states, the lack of recognizable eruption products suggests that the eruption, if any, was not particularly violent. The addition of a new thermal bath in Solfatara crater after this period in a place previously known only for its fumarolic activity suggests that it may have resulted from the raising of the water table into a previously sealed hot zone. Such phenomenon may have resulted by a subsidence of the ground up to 10 meters, which affected the area during the entire middle age. As far as I can tell, the Solfatara caldera formed around 40,000 years ago. One source states that this happened when Archflegro, the only volcano in the area, erupted for two weeks. The cave got empty and came out of the caldera. Now the cave is full of magma again, but the crater is closed. All other volcanoes are extinguished, only the Solfatara is still active with about 30 craters. Here, the earth is really elastic. It gets hotter and starts to inflate like the lid of a pot. After that, all comes back to normal. In the 1980s, the earth lifted up 1.6 meters. 
In the Middle Ages, the area was one of these sinking stages, and it seems in 1198, there was a steam-driven eruption. However, before we get into the 1538 eruption, let's talk about this sort of in-between time. What was the volcano up to for those 340 years? Well, mostly it was used as a bath. The Romans called this place Forum Volcani, dedicated to the god of fire, but it was essentially just a giant healing bathhouse for quite some time. There's evidence of this because of a famous poem, De Balnis. In this poem, there's an illustration of the Solfaterra crater, as so we can see, at least to some extent, how this area changed over time. Written between 1212 and 1221, it describes about 37 baths located in and around Puzzoli and the healing qualities of the waters there. It was meant to be a medical text, originally written in Latin verse based on personal experience and reports from others that benefited from the medical nature of the baths. My sources don't quite agree on when this was written. Some say it described 35 baths, not 37. Either way, I think you get the general point here. These spas were popping back in the day, though you know some sources say that the book might've actually just been so coveted because of its explicit images of people rather than for the science of the volcanic baths itself. You know, haha, poets gotta eat, right? A little bit of fan fiction in there, I guess. As for the medical or healing properties, some people say to this day, you can bear the rotten egg sulfur smell, breathing in the sulfur laden air is good for your body and skin. And that, as a child when I lived in Italy, is what I remember is we went there on multiple field trips and it always stunk like smelly, rotten egg. And hey, if you simply Google what the benefits of sulfur are, you might find a few promising results. Some say that sulfur has antibacterial effects that may promote the loosening and shedding of skin, which can help treating dermatitis or acne. But others explain that sulfur dioxide, what's in the air specifically, is a pollutant that can be deadly. One source explains, sulfur dioxide irritates the skin and mucous membranes of the eyes, nose, throat, and lungs. High concentrations of SO2 can cause inflammation and irritation of the respiratory system, especially during heavy physical activity. The resulting symptoms can include pain when taking a deep breath, coughing, throat irritation, and breathing difficulty. High concentration of sulfur dioxide can affect lung function, worsen asthma attacks, and worsen existing heart disease in sensitive groups. This gas can also react with other chemicals in the air and change to a small particle that can get into the lungs and cause similar health effects. All in all, avoid unhealthy exposure. There is mud bath tourism and saunas in the area, which I'd like to think are probably a bit safer than the thermal baths formed in these craters in the 13th century. Uh, so I'm not sure I trust medical claims of that era at all, but if you do want to experience like the nice thermal volcanic baths, go to the island of Ischia. It's like a short boat ride out of like the Bay of Naples and it's right there. It's in the bay. It's one of the three islands there. And it is, that's like a whole spa island full of beautiful thermal baths. It's really, really nice. Anyway, back to Solfaterra. As the paper states, if the Solfaterra bath is later addition to the Debalness, it may have resulted in a consequence of continuing subsidence of the ground, causing the raising of the water table and a possible small eruption caused by a sudden contact of the water table with hot rocks. Such occurrence is further supported by the Chronicle of St. Maria de Faria, which suggests that around the time of the 12th century, the Solfataro, known for its volcanic nature, however, the lack of clearly recognizable deposit rules out the possibility of a significant magmatic eruption. The subsidence or gradual sinking of the area during the Middle Age is further supported by the appearance during Middle Age of a crater Lake Agnano, which is not present in Roman times, but is clearly shown in the drawings of de Balnis. For a few hundred years, this was the extent of the volcano's activity. It was fairly quiet and popular for its naked people. I mean, for healing medical properties, naturally. But seriously, things seemed more normal and uneventful. That is until 1538. Although the 1198 eruption is debatable and minor, the eruption of 1538 is not, as the New York Times reported. Sitting within the Bay of Naples in Southern Italy is Campi Flegri, a vast and restless volcanic cauldron. The history of the Sleeping Colossus includes two massive eruptions, 39,000 and 15,000 years ago, that left deep calderas in the landscape. Its last significant volcanic event was 1538 eruption known as Monte Nuovo that spawned a small new mountain. 
Since then, it has been curiously eruption-free. The 1538 eruption was massive. Not only was this the first record of a new cone forming on a volcano, but it lasted about a week. It produced a lava lake, and near the end of the eruption when people were climbing on the cone, which why they were doing this, I have no idea, there was an eruption. Another steam blast explosion essentially, and 24 people were killed, some by falling and sliding down the cone. At distances of five kilometers, trees were knocked down by the eruption. About 12 meters of uplift preceded the eruption. This observation is based on the presence of borings made by marine organisms in marble pillars at the Temple of Seraphi. The columns were about 11 meters before sea level prior to 1000 AD. Shortly before the eruption started, the area near Pozzoli was uplifted four meters. To better understand the eruption of 1538, which formed the Monte Nuovo Cinder Cone, we don't have to go any further than this very temple. The Temple of Seraphide or Seraphis can reconstruct bradism, the slow movement of the Earth's surface, for us because the holes made by sea mollusks of the columns. Their boring provides evidence of the variations of ground level compared to sea level. So in essence, the temple slowly moves up and down with depending on how like the magma chamber underneath is vibing. And for the listeners on YouTube, I will try and insert some video of the temple because I was walking around it in 2018 when I last visited Naples. Uh, if I can find some of that footage, I will totally uh, make sure that it's inserted around this point so you guys can actually see it too. But anyway, another source explains, the Temple of Serfi was first excavated in the mid 18th century around the same time gentlemen archeologists were unearthing Herculaneum and Pompeii. The statue of Serapi was eventually placed in the National Archaeological Museum, and it wasn't until the early 20th century when archaeologists learned that the site of the Roman marketplace of Pozzoli was first built in the late first century AD. As you near the Massillum, the first thing you will notice is that it lies about 30 feet below sea level. The second is that its ancient granite columns seem to be suspended atop a murky pool of water, leaving you with the impression that they are either rising up from or descending into the sea. So why is it so important to understand this, you might ask, or, you know, not, it's fine, I'm gonna answer it anyway, but if we keep track of the uplift and monitor these events, then we can better prepare for another eruption such as this one. After all, this is a slow movement of the earth that doesn't happen all at once. And even if it takes weeks to evacuate an area around the volcanoes, if we study the uplift in the region, there would be plenty of time. Some sources say that the uplift before a 1538 eruption reached a climax in 1534 and earthquakes were felt in the area for four years, dramatically increasing before the eventual eruption. This isn't to say that surprise eruptions don't happen. A volcano on the island of Stromboli recently erupted in 2019, and at least in this area near Naples, there seems to be some sort of sign before a dramatic event. Is the area as quiet as we think? Well, perhaps. The most recent episode of unrest began in 1982. Over a two-year period, the area near Pozzoli was uplifted by 1.8 meters and the number and size of earthquakes increased. By mid-1984, the rate of uplift and number of earthquakes declined. Some people were evacuated to protect them from earthquake hazards. So in that dimension, the two fumaroles in this area, Bocca Grande and Bocca Nuova, have shown a lot of changes over the years, though the interpretation of the geochemical variations is still up for debate. New geysers have been detected, and in November 2019, a small earthquake swarm erupted, consisting of 38 very minor quakes, not above 0.4. My source states, inflation of the area around Puzzoli continues at steady, moderate rates with a maximum coverage of 0.7 cm per month, July 2017, totaling more than 50 cm in total in the past 10 years. Studies do seem to have a handle on this, and it's not like I'm about to start saying the earth is moving, run away, don't visit, it's too dangerous. It's a little unsettling knowing that earthquakes have taken place there recently, sure, but Campi Flegri is one of the world's most closely monitored volcanic areas. New studies have used computer models to simulate what may have occurred inside the volcano since the last caldera forming eruption 15,000 years ago. These studies show that Campi Flegri goes through stages. First, a massive eruption occurs, resulting in the formation of the caldera. Then the volcano enters a period of regular small eruptions as magma escapes through the new fractures in the crust. Finally, the volcano enters the pre-caldera phase. Minor eruptions become infrequent and magma accumulates in the subterranean reservoir. As it pools, the magma evolves into a water-rich gassy form and most buoyant bubble-rich patches gather at the top. This magma buildup may eventually culminate in another major eruption and the cycle would begin anew. 
Some may argue that cycles can be broken and this sustained period of relative calm doesn't mean that the volcano won't erupt again. Others believe Campi Flegri's cyclical nature is significant and can help to improve our understanding of calderas worldwide. Regardless of which camp you fall into here, the outcome remains the same. We may not be able to change an erupting volcano, but we can prepare ourselves, have proper evacuation procedures in place, and carefully monitor the area. In modern day, Solfatara has been known for offering tours. Their website claims, with an area of about 33 hectares, it is a natural oasis that offers the starting point for an interesting walk, offering not only the renowned volcanic phenomena such as fumaroles, moffets, and small volcanoes, but also wooded and Mediterranean vegetation, not to mention some natural geological, botanical, and wildlife wonders. The Solfatera in Pozzoli offers the opportunity for a quiet walk in an area rich in natural green, far from the usual noise of the city. A wide parking lot is provided for private vehicles and tourist buses just in the vicinity of the entrance. The path is only for pedestrians. Numerous directions and educational signs accompany visitors along the way and provide information on many landmarks and natural characteristics. The visit of the Solfatara has ancient roots in what was once the obligatory stops of the Grand Tour, the educational and leisure trip of the European aristocrats were making, especially in Italy and France during the 18th century. The average duration of the visit is 45 minutes. A refreshment bar in a richly wooded area allows a break at the end of the walk. The visit can be better appreciated if accompanied by one of the authorized local guides. In part because of the heat and the mineral rich soils, the nature around Solfaterra is truly thriving. It's really, really gorgeous. And the natural phenomena around here really fascinates me. Apparently steam will gradually grow thicker if you bring a small flame because of the tiny solid particles produced by the combustion as the ions in the atmospheric gas close to the flame act as a nuclei of condensation of steam itself. So, because science. And if you let a rock fall into the ground, even from a small height in specific parts of the crater, it will create a dull rumble. It creates the sense of there being a massive underground cavities when in actuality, it's due to micro cavities produced by the gas. On a note of touring, however, I do wanna emphasize the importance of being careful around these areas. It is an active geological site. One family was visiting Solfatara in 2017 when their 11 year old supposedly walked past a barrier into a prohibited area. Part of the crater collapsed, making a sort of quicksand where the ground is prone to crumbling. His father tried to help only to fall in and his mother also fell in and all three were trapped and lost consciousness because of the poisonous gases. The BBC wrote, firefighters managed to recover the three bodies and Pusoli mayor Vicenzo Figlioia said he had never come across such a tragedy at the site in 40 years. The surviving son was taken to a bar close to the entrance where owner Armando Guerrero told La Repubblica, we tried to calm him down as he was obviously very shocked. He was repeatedly asking for the rest of his family. The seven-year-old was later looked after by social workers and a psychologist. He was due to be reunited with his grandparents later. One source argues that the young boy didn't enter a prohibited area, that chasm hadn't been reported. I saw the whole scene. The child did not climb over anything. Mrs. Antonietta got in trouble for Volcano Sofaterra, the company that privately manages the site. She lives on the first floor of a public building in Via Costa Diagnano overlooking the Solfatera. She has seen the whole dramatic scene and is sure the boy did not climb over any fence. The newspaper Il Matino gathered his testimony. I heard the screams were those of the little brother of the dead child. I thought they were making a film as often happens here. She added, no fence, just a chain. Mrs. Antonietta's story is also confirmed by what was declared by another witness and by first responders. There are no barriers there, only a white and red, but very low chain. Certainly the killer hole, one and a half meters wide and two deep, was not inside the security fence, continues a witness in the morning who wished to remain anonymous. And taking a look at the photographs, the protections do seem pretty inadequate and I will say that much, but at the same time, I don't know what exactly happened and I don't want to speculate too much here. Three people lost their lives and a boy was left without his brother and his parents. So if you do happen to visit Solfatera, please be careful. Volcanoes can be dangerous whether they are active or not. So with that being said, that is where I'm going to end today's episode of Prism of the Past. I know it kind of ended on a really kind of dark and sour note, but it is a really beautiful site to visit nonetheless. If you do choose to visit it, I absolutely hope you learn something more than perhaps what you have learned in today's episode. But thank you all for tuning in and I will see you in the next one. Bye. 